Uh, let's talk about the financials then. CLSA believes that the narrative is changing for the large banks and the focus shifts from asset to asset quality from deposits, LDR and net interest margins itself. So to discuss the financial space in particular, a space that a lot of the investors like from the near to one year term for the markets as offering a space of value and perhaps some sort of support as well. Piran Engineer, who's the senior analyst at uh, CLSA joins in from the 27th CLSA India Forum. Thanks a lot, Piran, for joining in. You know, everyone's liking the financial space as it stands right now. However, the risk is that on the MFI space. So what are your thoughts? What are your top bets? And uh, what could be the downside risk when it comes to asset quality? See, I think uh, in the MFI space, uh, so the real issue has been of over leveraging of borrowers. The average indebtedness per borrower is up something like 50%, 45 to 50% over the last four years. Uh, and this is assuming a large influx of low income borrowers over the last four years. So uh, the borrowers that were there pre COVID would have indebtedness, which would be 60, 70, 80% higher today. Uh, now, with the new risk guardrails put in place a couple of months back, you're seeing that if you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, that stopped. Uh, that will take some time to uh, normalize. I would say when we've looked at past crises such as demonetization or COVID, demonetization took about two, three quarters to hit the peak and another two, three quarters or four quarters to fully normalize. Uh, in COVID, asset quality was a problem for two years. Now, the difference between those two crises and this is that in this crisis, there is no, um, there's no hit to the economy. There's no loss of income. So that's the good thing. But the bad thing is that, as I said, over indebtedness or indebtedness has gone up much more than average income. Uh, if I had to venture a guess, I would say uh, you, you see the peak in maybe 4Q of this year and then it starts to uh, moderate. However, what would be the steady state credit cost? Would it be 2 to 2.5%? Uh, unlikely. I think we've also seen a lot of center meeting discipline uh, go away after COVID and that really, the JLG format is what kept the credit costs low earlier. Uh, with this, what also comes is a higher cost of operations, right? Because you've got higher collections costs to do. Uh, and then lastly, on the other hand, you've had the regulator who's kept a sharp eye on what margins you're earning, what yield you're charging to the borrowers. So I think when you put all of this together, uh, the near term does look a bit bleak for uh, microfinance. So, uh, <clears throat> apparent, hi, good morning. Oh, it's, it's, are you saying it's unlikely to be mm -hmm. two, two and a half, so it, go, it gets up to what level, in your opinion? This is... This is industry-wide banking system NPAs, right? Oh, no, no, no. I was referring to credit costs and microfinance. I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So okay. Microfinance, typically, if you, yeah, if you look at this quarter, most of the MFIs have reported at least a 5% credit cost. And it's gone as high as north of 20%. So I was just saying that in the steady state, uh, the credit cost you would see for one of some of the better quality players used to be about two, two and a half percent. I don't think we get back to those levels. Just complete the point on uh, MFIs. So it's uh, not yet time to buy names like Credit Access, which arguably is the highest quality name there. Stocks halved, valuations are much lower than historical levels. <laughs> you think give it time? See, I, I think I think we'll uh, we'll refrain from stock specific ideas, but yes, I don't think that's the it's the right time to buy any MFI name at the moment. Okay, all right. Hi, Pran. Uh, good morning and good to see you. And this is Nigel on this side. You know, looking at some of your uh, recommendations, and uh, you're willing to uh, you know give the long arm to some of these names like Bandhan Bank, uh, you know, among others, which actually have been ranked underperformers. Could you uh, tell us, you know, some of these names you believe? Yeah which have actually been underperformers, they could perform from year on? Well, I think, see, there is, uh, if you look at this cycle versus, say, the prior cycles, uh, a couple of names that have stood out better in microfinance are Bandhan and Indescent. Uh, if you look at Bandhan, now let me take some numbers. There's slippages in microfinance used to be about 1,000 crores a quarter, three or four quarters ago. Uh, it dipped to about 500, and from 500, it's at 700. Slippages are up 30, 40%. Similarly, for Indescent, slippages are up 20, 30% in this worst quarter. Whereas if you look at some of the other NBFC, MFIs, or even some of the smaller banks uh, that do this business, the slippages in MFI are up 2, 3x, 200, 100 to 200%. 
So I think from that point of view, it's been better. Now, one could argue why has this happened. I think uh, there could be two, three reasons. One is that Bandhan is one of the few banks that still follows a weekly center meeting model. Uh, the second is if you look after COVID, which is FY22 onwards, uh, they've barely grown their balance sheet in MFI, right? Their growth is like 3 4%. All the other players were growing at 25 30%. So not by design, but just by, uh, by chance, they've avoided you know, the bad borrowers in this cycle. Uh, thirdly, they've been reducing, uh, or as a consequence of that, the share of microfinance has been reducing. So I think when I look at all of this and, uh, you know, where, when I look at where valuations are, risk-reward looks favorable in this case. If you had to bet on just one financial stock over the next 12 months, uh, Piran, what would you suggest that would be? I would say Bajaj Finance. I think this is one of the names that has been, uh, well, once upon a time a darling of the street, uh, I think heavily misunderstood now. Uh, the stock's gone nowhere for the last three years. Uh, in the last three to four quarters, there have been some, uh, you can say, headwinds. Margins are down 60, 70 bips. Credit costs are up 30, 40 bips. Uh, they, they've seen some, uh, they had seen some loss of fee income. I think slowly and steadily the, head, uh, the headwinds are easing. You've seen fee income, which was lost due to the RBI ban, come back up. Uh, the margin reduction trajectory is slowing down. Last quarter, margins were down only 5, 6 bits, and I think year on it remains largely stable. Credit costs could see another, you could see another quarter or so of elevated credit costs, post which things start to recover. I think when we put all that together, we're talking about a large cap franchise, good corporate group, good governance. Uh, giving you 25% plus, you know, PAT, uh, loan growth and PAT growth and available at 19, 20 times earnings. If I were to think about uh, India, which other 50 billion plus dollar market cap stocks are likely to give you 25% PAT CAGR? I can't think of any across sectors, right? Uh, and when I put all this together and look at where valuations are, I think that makes it a good bet. Now, does it work in three months, six months, 12 months? I don't know, but I think this is one stock that should be in everyone's portfolio. All right, uh, Gatta, thanks a lot for joining and wishing you a good conference. And we've taken uh, note of that, Bajaj Finance. You know, uh, yesteryear, darling, and could come back into play in the next one year or so.